Finance are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to the podcast in uh, the nation with the longest introduction ever. Trust me, we do have that, and we're looking at the uh, world record to get in the book. So um, we're, we're actually excited today. Landon and I are excited to, to be hosting Will Button with Will Button Consulting. Uh, Will Button Consulting is a management consulting company focused on converting your software and technology ideas into profitable, sustainable solutions, which uh, we all need, obviously, uh, specifically technology companies. So, Will, we're excited to have you in, in uh, the studio today. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so we were talking a little bit before the show started, and you told us a little bit about your about your family, but we always like to start by having you do that for our listeners. And, you know, I think it gives us an eye into who you are and, and what kind of brought you to, to where you are today. So just give us some idea on, on your background, where you grew up, where you are today, wife, kids, that sort of thing. Right on. Uh, born and raised in Texas. And then the day that I hit 18, took off traveling the United States and have been all over the United States since then. Um, been in Arizona here for about 10 years now have a wonderful significant other, two kids, to both boys, 23 and 21. And um, professionally, you know, I got started in IT back in the mid 90s and worked for a while in IT and then went to software engineering, back to IT, back to software engineering, and just worked both sides of those. Uh, and spent a lot of time working with small companies and startups. And one of the things that I really learned during that experience was this sort of different interpretation of the customer. You know, typically we think of the customer as the customer of the company who buys your end product. But I learned from a technology perspective that for like an IT department, the customer is the software engineering team. And for the software engineering team, their customer is the sales and marketing teams and the finance team. And it was particularly important for startups and small businesses that you really get those teams integrated. Like for a startup, you know, you have a fixed amount of capital, which gives you a fixed window of time that you have to find your customers and turn that into a revenue stream or it's all over. And so I started digging into that challenge and really enjoying it and understanding what were the needs of each team's customers and how can you better serve those needs? Because if you're, Software, and if your IT team can help your software engineering team deliver code faster, then they can help the sales and marketing team identify your prospects and convert them into paying customers faster, which helps the finance team do the budgeting and forecasting that ultimately leads to a better product going out the door that ultimately serves the customers of the company, which are the people who are actually whipping out their credit card to buy your product. Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting take on things and, and something quite honestly that gets glossed over a lot with startups or, or newer companies in that, um, you know, there is a delineation or, or there should be some distinction between internal customers and external customers, right? And, and every company does have internal customers. We just may not put it that way, but I think that it would help the management team if they did foster that in their employees right from the get-go so that they understand that they are serving a customer uh, internally, and that's going to end, you know, end up providing a better product for the external customer in the end. Yeah, it saves a lot of frustration. You know, if you know who it is that you're delivering tools or services to, and what their needs are. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So, 1995, you decided to go out on your own. So, what what kind of led you to that decision of of deciding, you know what, it, it's time for me to, to do this on my own and, and I've identified a niche for myself here. What, give us some background on that decision making. It was, um, it's been a back and forth on the, on my own part. I've done it on the side for a while, but then I've had some, some companies that I've worked for as an employee, you know, as a, as one of the uh, startup employees and, you know, it's just been, um, to be honest, it's just been an entertainment thing for me. <laughs> it was something that I, I fell into and discovered it and really enjoyed it. And then along the way, I was like, oh, wait a minute, people will pay me to do this. 
and it just sort of evolved from there. Yeah. So we've, we haven't known each other long. I mean, we've spoken for maybe 20 minutes before the program started, but I, I get the sense from spending time with you that you're um, maybe a bit of a free spirit and wasn't, and you didn't enjoy working for other people. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's probably very fair to say. I've, I've got uh, a, a very distinct case of shiny object syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to have to try to use that one with uh, diagnosing, you know, maybe children in the future, shiny object sind- syndrome rather than ADD or ADHD, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, it's a milder version of that, but the destructive forces of it are pretty comparable. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, you know, it's funny though. I, you know, I've been in the business world and, and self-employed for close to 20 years now, maybe a little over 20 years. Um, and then before that, I, I grew up in a family where my dad was an entrepreneur as well. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of really all I've known. But the reality is that shiny obje- object syndrome that you're talking about or ADD or whatever it is, it's very common in business owners right and it can be a very very good thing because it can it can lead to thinking outside the box it can lead to being um inventive right or innovative um but then we notice as the business starts to grow a little bit then it can it can also be destructive right, right. sometimes you either have to hire somebody to offset some of the issues that that person brings to the table or you bring somebody else in to run the organization and you're just the innovator right we kind of saw that with like a steve jobs for example right or, you know, a lot of people like that who are great, great minds and, and very innovative, but they're not managers or operators, right? Would you say that that's the case with you or you're, you rein it in pretty well and, and still operate quite well? No, I would say that's definitely the case. I, um, you know, I, I get really excited at the, the start of a project whenever you have all of these unknowns and trying to determine what the, the product is and who the, the customer is for that and how to return that into a profitable process. But then the more and more of those check boxes that I get checked off, my interest in it fades and starts <laughs> going somewhere else. But there's actually a really good book that touches on that. Um, uh, Ready, Fire, Aim by Michael Masterson. It's a great book. Great he book. touches on that a lot, you know, and how the entrepreneur spirit is good for certain parts. And then the part I liked most about that was where he identified almost in check and like a checklist fashion of here's where you're going to stumble and here's what you need to do to address that along the way. If you're going to continue growing the business. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you for advice for others because we know that there are lots of other listeners who are listening and, and have the same kind of an issue, what advice you would give, but that's anything you'd add besides the ready fire aim book as, as advice to, kind of deal with and overcome that? Um, I, th- I think that book does a great job of, of summing it up. The one place that I see with a lot of people I've worked with where they struggle with this, um, in their first couple of products, one of the things I see a lot of people doing is waiting too late to actually launch that product. You know, Because the intimidation factor is there. If you, if you take out your phone and you look at open the Facebook app or Instagram or go to amazon.com, you know, that's a pretty polished professional experience. And so a lot of people building their first time product kind of set that as the bar and they'll spend a ton of time on that, that professional and that polish, perhaps too much time because what you really need to do with that first product is get it in front of the customers to start getting that early feedback because there's always this difference between what you think the customers want and what the customers told you they wanted and what they actually want. And so if every day that you spend not finding out what that gap is, you're spending time and money that you may not have. Um, and, you know, the, the objection to that is I can't launch this product, you know, until it looks great. But the reality of it is if you're launching a product or if, you're, if your product is delivering more value than what the customer paid for it, they honestly don't care what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that, like you said, that can be a common pitfall, right? When you're trying to throw out a technology, you have a vision in your head and it's not quite there. And so you don't quite get there. So, you know, you can obviously take it to the customer, but any other suggestions as to what they might do in terms of 
bringing in an advisory board or bringing in like a focus group to look at certain things? Like what, what have you seen work to avoid those types of pitfalls in the past? I think the thing that really, the only thing you can really count on is getting people to give you money for it. You know, that's the, the ultimate litmus test. And that's the one that you can't, you can't uh, sway that opinion either way. It's putting the product out there, finding your potential customers, and then seeing whether or not they buy, and then trying to figure out why they didn't buy. Okay. Yeah. So try it, try it out, see if people will buy it. And if they don't buy it, then you know there's something wrong and there's something you got to fix. But, you know, maybe it's just a different iteration and you, and you get there. But the biggest pitfall you see most commonly is that entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs specifically will wait too long to get a product out there. Yeah, they'll want, it, you know, they have that perfectionist gene. And so they want it to be perfect before they launch. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good way to put it. I think, you know, all of us are perfectionists to a certain extent, right? And we've got to try to overcome that a bit. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to find the balance of it. Yeah. So they, they, they shouldn't adopt this necessarily. I don't know if you can see that. No. <laughs> <I can. laughs> ready, ready, fire in. This is my little paperweight that uh, is over on my bookshelf right here. I had to grab it and show it to you. I love it. I love it. It's perfect. I, I did yeah, a little yeah, concerned yeah. when I saw you out of the corner of my eye get up and walk away. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder if Lannon will come back or maybe he brought one of the twins with him to the office today. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, had, I had to grab that to show. I had to grab that to show Will. Um, so, Will, I know that um, you, you're a pretty big fan of working remotely. I, I think that you have done that. For, for a number of years. And uh, due to the times that we're in, a lot of people have had to, you know, hone that, that skill in because they may not have had that prior to being forced into doing it right now. So we'd love to just kind of hear your thoughts, suggestions, tips, and tricks on, you know, how do, how do you, how do you effectively work remotely, you know, here going forward? Yeah. You know, I think a couple months ago, whenever a lot of companies had to shift to being complete remote, they're going to learn that that was probably the easier shift versus what is actually happening right now, because now you've got some companies that are opening back up, but a lot of them are still uh, making it so that their employees can choose to work from home if they're not ready to come back into the office yet. And that's where things get really tricky is whenever you have part of your staff in the office and part of your staff remote, and especially if the culture of your company is that where when you have a question, you get up and you walk over to someone's desk, you know, or you see them in the break room or whatever. So when you have those remote employees, they miss out on a lot of that stuff. And so one of the things I've learned to deal with that is anytime that I get involved into in a, a Google Hangout or um, a Zoom conference or anything like that is understanding that 90% of this conversation has already taken place before I even knew that there was a topic. So the first role that I have whenever I go into a meeting is trying to figure out what that conversation was before I was engaged. And one of the things you can do to help with that is just read the body language of the room if it's a video conference, particularly of the non-primary speaker. So if someone in the conference asks you a question and someone else you know, crosses their arms or something or leans over and whispers to something else, that's a big indicator of some other conversation that's already happened. And it's, it's worth drilling into just so that you have the full context of the conversation so you can add the value that you can. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point. You do, I, I hadn't really thought about that, but you're absolutely right that when you're not in the office, you may miss the conversation ahead of time and you can see them disengaged on their cell phone, like you said, leaning over and saying something to somebody else. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I had thought about that. But when you started talking about the difficulties in going back, I expected you to go to you know, offices trying to figure out how to social distance and still have enough space or how do they work their space now? Or do we really even need an office now? Right. right. I know there are a lot of those types of conversations going on. I mean, we're here at the Mac six conscious workspace in Tempe and it's all about small businesses, many of them tech startups and, and trying to decide, do I still need an office space? Is it beneficial for me to have this? And, and, and I know that that's a big deal as a, as a real estate company, right, that's providing office space, trying to figure out what the future looks like and, and making sure that they're adapting to provide for the company's futures and how they envision them going forward. 
yeah, it'll be interesting to see over the next year how many companies actually change their their culture and their working environment permanently as a result of this. Yeah, and, and I I think the jury's still out, right? But I I do think that there are many companies that have already said, you know, our our employees are going to work from home through the end of the year. Some are saying many of our employees won't ever come back. Uh, to working inside of an office. And so we are starting to see the first iterations of that, but there's certainly still more to come. Um, everybody can't work from home, right? right? Like every organization, that's not possibility, possible. You can't manufacture a car from home, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's, there's still going to be people that have to come into offices or, or other work spaces to be able to accomplish things. And there is still you've already mentioned it, some, some things that can be lacking in remote working, right? Cause that face-to-face -face interaction or being able to, to sit in a room and write on a whiteboard together and different things like that can, can really lead to some pretty intense innovation and, you know, those sorts of things. So, you know, I, I think there'll still be some value for workspace, but it'll be interesting to see how, you know, how our entrepreneurs and innovators kind of work their way through this. Yeah, you know, there's, um, I think one of the other difficulties in working remote is relying on text communication because, you know, as, as humans, when we communicate, most of our language comes from body language, facial expressions, tone of voice. And if you're typing a text message or a, a chat message or an email to someone, you lose all of that. And it's a lot of people don't understand that the tone of voice you wrote your message in is likely not the tone of voice that the recipient is reading it in. You know, especially if, if it's someone who's working at home, you know, and they have sick family members and they've had some financial setbacks these last few months, they're gonna read your message in that tone of voice from that perspective. And it, it sounds really dumb, but one of the things I've found is most effective at dealing with that is with pretty much every text-based communication I send, it has a meme or a GIF along with it because it provides visual context to how I'm really trying to convey the message. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that it's important. I mean, even, even five years ago, I would have conversations with people that either worked for me or with me or a client in, in making sure, and I would even kind of put a disclaimer in saying, just remember you cannot read tone from words right. in an email, right? I wanna be clear that I'm not upset or, you know, this is important, but I, I understand completely, you know, something like that so that there, that tone can be added in. And if there's kind of some frustration going back and forth at any point, then it's time to pick up the phone and, and make sure that they can hear that tone of voice and, and you work through it together, right? Yeah, because it may be several iter iterations of that conversation before you even understand that there's a, a tone of voice conflict in that text thread. Right. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes to hiring specifically now, or even just in general, as you're, you know, if you're talking to an entrepreneur that's getting ready to expand, right? When you start with a tech startup, it's typically you, you've got an idea, maybe you've got a partner, but there comes a point where you're hiring people for specific specializations that they bring to the table to help you get this project across the finish line and form it into an actual company. So what advice do you have for our entrepreneurs that are listening that, to, you know, in terms of hiring and what they can do to make sure that you're hiring the right way to get a product launched appropriately. Yeah, for a lot of startups, you know, you have those key startup employees, you know, those, they're typically engineers who are just have a career of working with startups and they're kind of independent, rogue, cowboyish, likely to be entrepreneurs themselves, but just aren't at the moment. And those are the people that you want to recruit early on because they're just going to see your vision and they're going to go execute on it. But they're not, they're probably not going to stay with you long term, right? They're, they have that same shiny object syndrome that we've already talked about. And once they've delivered the first iteration of your product and they start seeing the, the long term vision, it's going to get kind of boring for them. So they're going to go and, and find something else to work on. But whenever it comes to hiring, you know, you typically you staff for some expected demand. You know, you, if you look at a sales chart, you know, you start with your sales figures in the, the lower left-hand quadrant and then your anticipated numbers are in the upper right-hand quadrant, but it's not a linear path to get there. You know, there's this thing, I learned about it several, several years ago called the S-curve of business growth. 
and I don't, I don't remember where I was introduced to that, but it's, it's the path isn't linear. It's an S curve. So it, in the middle there somewhere, there is this plateau where, you know, it could be that you've, uh, you know, you've exhausted your marketing channel for finding new prospects or you've reached the scaling capacity for the way your business is currently built or, you know, could be even something crazy and really obscure, like a global pandemic shuts down the economy for a couple months. You yeah. know, I mean, that, that seems would, that unlikely. Would be crazy. Right? That would never happen. I mean, that's sci-fi stuff. But <laughs> it, it could happen. Um, but e either way, you know, at some point you're going to have this plateau. And for a startup, you've got a fixed amount of cash and you've got your daily burn rate, which gives you a finite window of time that you have to reach profitability or you're out of cash. And so whenever you hit that plateau, it, it cuts down on your revenue that's coming in. So your daily burn rate is not the same, which shortens your window. And then to, to deal with that, if you're going to continue to, to reach for that full window, you've got to cut expenses. And a lot of times that means if you hired early on, you're going to have to lay off those employees that you just hired. So one, another approach that I like to, to this is actually holding off on hiring as long as possible, but there's some, some challenges to doing that, right? First of all, you're gonna be putting all of this growth on your existing employees. So they're gonna be working harder, and it's up to you as the leader to make sure that they are, you know, that they're focused on keeping those employees motivated, they're delivering the things that they need to do their job, and keep them from uh, burning out. But the benefit to doing it this way is anything that's not absolutely critical to pushing product out the door for your customers is just going to get dropped by the wayside. You know, it's, if it's not necessary, they're going to stop doing it. And so the end result of that is whenever you do get to the point where you can hire people, you're going to be hiring people into an efficient workflow rather than hiring them into an inefficient workflow. I think it was Bill Gates that said automation applied to an inefficient process magnifies the inefficiencies, but automation applied to an efficient process magnifies the efficiencies. And he was specifically talking about software, but I think the same thing applies to hiring. Yeah, I think, I think it probably applies to <clears throat> many different business processes, right? And so um, just real quick before we go to a break, to, you know, so would you say early on that it makes more sense to hire some of the engineering or other functions maybe on a contract basis, like through an Upwork or a Fiverr, or, you know, whatever, whatever's appropriate for these particular, for what they need, right? Yeah, that's, that's one way that's, that's actually very common for people to go, you outsource that and, um, and have them build that initial product. And then once you once you've determined your customer market, you know, and you've got a product that's selling, then you start bringing in those resources in house. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors, and we'll jump back in with many more probing questions for Will Button. At Paylocity, we deliver more than our awesome product suite with crazy good reviews. We prioritize your success by covering you with a deep support system to back up our easy to use, innovative HR solutions. Everything we do is designed to support you in reaching your goals. Together, we tackle your day-to-day -day work so that you can spend more time building the culture you and your employees crave. For professionals who crave true partnership, Paylocity is the HR and payroll company that frees you from the tasks of today so together we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Let's go forward together. All right, welcome back. I'm gonna to toss it over to Landon here for a second, uh, assuming he's still awake with his uh, twins keeping him up all night last night. I, I'm not quite sure if he's ever awake. Yeah, I, I'm not either, so we're on the same page. Hey, Will, um, Doing a little bit of research prior to our conversation today, um, I think I was poking around on your website or, or a, an article that you had written or something, and it, it, you were talking about how you're a big supporter of multiple streams of income. Um, I think that that's really relevant uh, right now. Uh, so if you could, can you talk about what that 
what that means to you, what that looks like to you, and then um, how you've kind of executed on that and how it's, how it's benefited you, you know, going through this, uh, these challenging times that we're in right now. Yeah. Uh, I am, um, I'm a firm believer in multiple streams of income because it takes a lot of the pressure off of you. You know, so many of us have a single job and your entire financial livelihood is dependent on that job. And one of the things I learned early on in my career, because I chose to work in startups, is that just because you have a job doesn't mean you're going to get paid for it. And so that was really the primary motivation for discovering multiple streams of income. Uh, it's, it's just a fact of life in startups is sometimes a startup doesn't make it. And so as, a, as the provider for my family, you know, we had certain financial commitments we had to meet to keep a roof over the head, keep the lights on, keep food on the table. And so that was really what started me down this path. Um, for people in my line of work and lines of work similar to me, it's actually really easy to get started doing multiple streams of income because you can take on side jobs, you know, for a client who just needs some part-time work. Or the one thing that I did was I started creating uh, videos on how to write code and distributed those through some different content providers. And it turned out to be this royalty type scenario. So I recorded these videos years ago, but every month I still get a check from people who are continuing to watch those videos. And it sort of, it sort of feeds on itself when you start doing that because at first, you know, it was 50 bucks a month or 70 bucks a month. And then it grew from there. And then I did more videos and it grew from there. And then all of a sudden it was paying the, the internet bill, you know, and then it was paying, you know, the grocery bill. And then we reached a point where it was covering the mortgage every month. And I sort of had this light bulb moment. It's like, wait a minute, I don't even have to work this month and the mortgage is covered. And so it gave me a huge amount of freedom in the types of clients I could pursue, the types of work that I could pursue, because I knew that I could take these big risks and the cost of failure was really, really small because our basic family living expenses were covered. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Austin, in our, in our profession, you know, one of the ways that you can choose to get compensated is by, you know, essentially creating a, a recurring revenue stream for, you know, money that you manage for clients. And that certainly uh, helps to, you know, provide a, a, a buffer, a safety net, a, a peace of mind, if you will, so that when the economy does you know, take a turn for the worse that you know that you can rely on some predictable uh, income. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, for a lot so, of people. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say for a lot of people, you know, it doesn't have to even be in your primary profession. You know, if you happen to, if you're a, an accountant, but you paint on the side, you know, you can, you can do paintings or music or something that's a, a hobby, you know, and it's a great way to get to spend time doing your hobby, but also generate a little bit of revenue that way as well. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. Sorry. Lenny. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, that's a great point because my follow-up question was going to be, well, our listeners are going to be thinking to themselves, well, you know, how do you, how do you start down that road? And I, I love that suggestion that you just made because uh, that's a great place to start. Find something that you enjoy doing outside of work that you can potentially get paid to do and start doing it for your friends and your neighbors and your, your church congregation. And all of a sudden you've got this little side business built up and you've got some, some, you know, a, uh, an alternate stream of income. So I love that thought. Yeah, no, I'm glad you clarified because with a body like mine, I went right to stripping, which is what, you know, <laughs> what, where I would go for a second revenue stream. <laughs> But uh, no, uh, in all seriousness, um, no, I think, I think that it, it makes great sense. I mean, everybody needs to be, to do what they can to insulate themselves from things that are unknown or unexpected. Right. And we, we've, we've just seen it with a pandemic. And so we've got to do everything we can to, to prepare ourselves. So, um, Speaking of unexpected, I mean, I wanted to ask you what, what steps you think, you know, companies can take with an online presence to prevent downtime or server outages, right? Because we never know when they're going to come. So what should 
specifically tech companies or non-tech companies because we all have servers and, and those sorts of things that we're that we're running off of to prevent uh, outages. Yeah, the most important thing is to two two parts to that. One is you can't eliminate downtime. A lot of people will spend a lot of time and money to do it, uh, but really good examples of that are companies like Twitter, you know, which has a fairly substantial internet presence. They still go down from time to time, as does Google and Facebook. Um, so if, if companies of that magnitude aren't able to maintain 100% availability, odds of us as a smaller company um, are not in our favor for doing that. So just understand that it's, it's going to come, it's going to happen, and it's not the end of the world when it does. The key to navigating it successfully is having a plan before it happens. So things like, you know, discuss with your team, um, what are the different levels of severity that we're concerned with? Is it the website's down or just part of the website's down or it's down for people in a specific region? You know, and, and just break it down into the categories that are important to you. And once you do that, for each of those categories you identified in the, the same document, just right below that, say, here's what I want to do when this happens. You know, the first step is always going to be contact your senior, senior engineers so that they can start diagnosing the problem, finding out what's going on, getting you back up online. But then you may want to do some other things too. So for a, something that's a little bit higher priority on your severity list, you may choose to call some of your account managers in so that they can contact your key customers and give them a heads up of what's going on. And then for you know, your, your highest severity, probably gonna call the CEO so that they can start contacting investors and key stakeholders and giving them a heads up as well. And so having that documented ahead of time makes it a whole lot easier for whoever happened to be on call at 3 a.m. to call the CEO's cell phone if the conversation is gonna have context. Yeah. You know, if you're just dialing the CEO and haven't had this conversation up front, it's gonna be an awkward conversation, but if you can call the CEO and say, hey, we've got a severity one incident in process, then they know, oh, okay, we agreed that you were gonna call me. And then the other part of that is uh, if you're able to identify that and contact your customers and your investors and your stakeholders before they hear about it on Twitter or Facebook or however they hear about it, they're gonna be thrilled. I mean, they're gonna be a little bummed that there was downtime, but they're gonna be so much more thrilled than if they tried to use your service and they weren't able to because it was down and you hadn't notified them. Yeah, no, no, I think that uh, one, understanding that it is gonna happen, right? And, and accepting that, but then having that, that plan in place. And like you said, communicate with your stakeholders, whoever that may be. And, you know, I, I personally just lived this, I'm sure that Landon did, you know, with everything that went on with, with COVID-19, you know, I found that by being proactive and calling my clients and saying, you know, we've planned for this, right? We didn't expect a pandemic, but our portfolios are put together expecting volatility, for example. Um, and just, you know, reaching out to them and letting them know we are aware, we are watching your accounts, we know what's going on. It, it the responses that I got from them, as opposed to an advisor who waits for the phone to ring or hopes that the phone never rings, Right. Um, it is much better. And I found personally that the clients responded very positively and I actually even picked up new accounts and referrals from it by being proactive. So having the plan I think is huge and then being ready to communicate that plan when it does happen is super important. Yep, for sure. Uh, because in a lot of cases, like the scenario you just mentioned, you know, they may have had a hundred other things on their time, on their mind, but then you called them like, oh, that's right. I hadn't even thought about that. Glad you called because yeah. had I thought about it a few days from now, I would have been pretty upset. Yeah. Yeah, I did actually have one client that managed to call me before I called him. And I said, I'm working my way down the list and you're, you know, you're, you were close. Um, you know, cause he, he started by saying, I'm sure your phone's ringing off the hook and people are upset, but I, you know, I just need to know what's going on. And I said, well, actually you're the first person that that's called. Um, I just hadn't gotten through the alphabet, you know, quickly enough yet to get to you. Here's what's going on. I am aware of it. Yes. It's not great to look at your portfolio and realize that it's down. <laughs> right. right. Um, but this is what the market is down. This is what you're down. And there's a large gap between that. And it's because we anticipated this volatility and we're, we're positioned appropriately for you. 
So, you know, that's the way I would communicate it, but that, you know, I'm in a very different business than you, but it's the same principle and it applies to anybody who's listening in any business. We have to be prepared for the unknowns that really can't be unknowns, right? We have to anticipate that they're going to come and know how we're going to respond to them when it does happen. Yeah. I think that's part of the unspoken contract with the customer is whenever they give you money for a service, they are doing so with the expectation that you've thought all of these scenarios through and are going to do the right thing when it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Super important. Yeah. Communication, communication, communication. It, it hurts a lot, a whole lot less to get punched in the gut when someone says, Hey, I'm going to punch you in the gut rather than just getting punched <laughs> in the gut. <laughs> you have time to tighten those muscles, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, Austin, before we get into our next little segment here with Will, should we take a few minutes to uh, recognize one of our sponsors? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to a sponsor and then you can, you can take it when we come back. Excellent. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. So, Will, a um, couple of our prior guests, guests on, on the show um, have mentioned, uh, we've talked about outsourcing. I feel like that's a common theme, uh, not, not just with our guests, but um, just a common theme in, in business. I feel like that's something that is starting to happen and be a lot more prevalent in business. Um, so, you know, you as a, as a consultant to a lot of, you know, small businesses and startups, you know, what are some recommendations that you might have for some smaller companies when it comes to outsourcing, you know, specifically development, whether it's website or, you know, um, app development. Yeah. Outsourcing actually makes a lot of sense for those smaller companies because engineering teams or, or developers are really hard to come by. And when you do come across them, it's really hard to quantify their skill set versus your needs. And so outsourcing allows you to just contact a company and give them your description and then they can deal with all the technical aspects of making that happen where i see a lot of people fall through on that is um, not actually owning the code that gets created by the outsourced company right so they'll hire this company they'll they'll build whatever it is and let's say it's a web application or or even a you know a phone-based application they'll submit it to the apple Apple Store or the Google Play Store or push the code up onto your web server. And so it's running, but you don't actually have the source code that created that thing. And so as if your app is successful or your website's successful, you're going to grow your team. You're going to try to bring those skills in house. And you're going to need that code, which is, you know, it could add some brittleness to that relationship with that vendor, you know, as they see that transition coming and it's rare, but I've seen a few instances where, you know, the vendors weren't just really ready to let go of that relationship and they had the source code. So they kind of had control of it. So I would recommend to anyone doing that, the very first thing to do is go to github.com and just create an account there and make sure that your code goes there. So whenever you hire your outsourced company, Say all the code belongs into belongs in this repository. It can't live anywhere else, and you can further lock that down by setting up systems so that the code goes from GitHub to your web server only. You know the the outsourced team doesn't even have access to your servers, so you ensure that all of the code they write has to go through that repository, and then you always have control over that. So, so do you typically write something like that into your outsourced contract, for example, the contractor that you've hired, the contract states that it goes to github.com and that they don't own the code in any way, that sort of thing? Yeah, for sure. Um, you state that the code has to be there and then you can even um, build in systems that, uh, you know, that automate that process for you. So then you, 
you don't have to rely on anyone's word for it. You've got a, an automated system in place making that happen that you can count on. But you, you touched on a really good point there, the intellectual property itself too. That's another really strong component of the contract to have because the way that intellectual property laws are worded is whoever writes the, in the, in the case of software, whoever writes the software owns the intellectual property rights to that unless they sign it over to someone. So if you were to hire me to build your website, I could do it, give you the code, unless we sign that agreement where I transfer those intellectual property rights over, I still own the intellectual property for that website, even though you paid me to actually build it. So that's another key component to have in your contract when you're outsourcing work. Yeah. Yeah. Not being a tech, a tech startup guy, I wouldn't have thought about that, I don't think. And, and it makes me think about just some of the logo design work and different things like that, that I've had done for my own personal website. And luckily the guy who uh, does all that for me happens to be a family member, so he knows better, but <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it, uh, it is still something to think about for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So nowadays, right, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We thought it was all sci-fi stuff and it wasn't, it wasn't going to happen, but it, it has happened. And unfortunately, a lot of people have, have gone through a lot of changes over the last few months. Um, and a lot of people are in some pretty tough financial decisions, some of them business owners, some of them uh, just individuals, right? And, you know, our economy runs based on small businesses. It's really why Landon and I launched this radio program and, and you know, it's called Tycoons of Small Business, you know it, but it's that 99% of the businesses in our country are actually small businesses. Everybody thinks of the Amazons and the Walmarts and the Facebooks of the world, but um, the reality is most businesses are small businesses. Most businesses are running on a tight budget. Startups specifically are running on tight budgets. And so, you know, with, with where we are today, all businesses have had to tighten their belts a little bit, um, and some have had to tighten their belts an awful lot. So, you know, specifically in your sphere of what your, you know, your experience is in technology and whatnot, what are you seeing among those companies that they're spending money on that maybe they shouldn't be or that they can lower a little bit to be able to weather this storm? Yeah, the number one thing I see over and over again is uh, I've come up with a term for it just called credit card infrastructure. And what it means is whenever you sign up for, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the services we use are, are paid services. Like if you want to host a server, you can go to Amazon and, and just pay a monthly fee for that. Or if you want to send out emails to um, your email list, you can use MailChimp through their paid service for that. And so we have all of these different paid services that we use to run our business that we've put on our credit card. And so the one thing I see over and over is because I deal with the technology industry a lot and engineers are kind of creative and curious people, we tend to go and try something and then go, oh, no, 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 that didn't work. And then we'll go and try something else. And so what happens over time is, you know, the engineers will try product X to meet a, a certain need and then it doesn't work. So they'll drop that one and go to product Y for it. But there's not really a full communication loop there to let everyone know that product X shouldn't be billing our credit card anymore. And so the way the process usually works is the credit card statement comes into the finance team. Finance team says, oh, this is a CTO's credit card. And then the statement, and they look at it and go, oh, that's for this thing, and this is for that thing. And, you know, they don't really piece it all together that they've got duplicate services there. Um, or they may not even realize that the team has transitioned to a different product. Um, and so they end up paying for things twice. And I've seen this get really, really expensive on multiple occasions. So one of the things I think you can do to address that is whenever the credit card statement comes in to the finance team, whoever owns the card is responsible for signing off on the expenses that they personally put on the card, you know, whether it was client meals or gas for the kind of car or whatever it was on there. But any of these services get tagged for the senior engineer for that team. And the senior engineer is the one who actually signs off. Yes, we're still using that service. And then what happens is whenever the senior engineer says, we, uh, we're not using the service as a trial anymore, we're committed to using this service, that's the signal for the finance team to get it off the credit card. Call the vendor up, have them switch over to invoicing you. And so now that's gonna come off of the credit card and they're gonna start sending invoices, which lets a couple of things happen. 
One, it gets it off of your credit card so you're not incurring finance charges if there's finance charges associated with that card. The other is by going to an invoice system, your finance team is going to set a budget item for that. And so it's going to become a budgeted item. And then if that bill changes, whenever the finance team gets that invoice, they're going to say, hey, this is the wrong amount. And they're going to talk to the senior engineer and have a conversation about, you know, was this because we used more of the service than we were anticipating or did the pricing structure change? Are we expecting to, you know, are we expecting this to be a different amount when you reset the budget? Budget. But it, it just wraps everything up so that you don't have these hidden costs just lurking around on credit cards. Yeah. That's funny. I didn't I did not expect you to go to the books on that. I thought there was <laughs> gonna be certain fees, you know, don't outsource this, outsource that, you know, that sort of a, a response. But um it's funny because last week we talked about it. We've probably talked about it every episode we've had so, so far, is you know, that's typically not a problem early on. You're using very few services, you know every dime that you're spending. But as the company grows a little bit, you kind of lose track of those sorts of things and you think revenue solves all, we're good, right? right. And, and the statistics are still terrible on businesses failing in the first few years. It's not just survive the first year or survive the first and second year. It's, not, you know, there's still very high failure rates later on in a, in a company's lifetime. And what you just described is a major reason why. They kind of lose track of, of the spending. They think, you know, our revenue's here, everything's good. And they're just not honing in on what they can do to be more profitable, right? Yeah. Over the last few years, we've had this scenario in the startup industry of, um, you know, like spend your way to success. And that's, it's such a, a strange philosophy to me, you know, that you can even approach a business like that. And that philosophy does nothing to try and corral problems like this. You know, it could make a it could make a huge difference financially for this company as to when they're profitable and when they're not. But if you've got this spend your way to success mentality, then you know you see yourself spending, you see your company spending more money. You're like, that must mean we're more successful. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's funny. I think specifically as small businesses today, and and maybe specific to tech startups. You know, you see companies like Uber and um, even Tesla, for example, you know, all these companies that have never been profitable, right? Never, not once, not one year have they been profitable. Their stock prices are through the roof. You know, um, Elon Musk is very, very wealthy and yet his business doesn't make any money yet, right? They're producing way fewer cars than the Ford Motor Company, for example, yet his price, his stock price is a hundred times the stock price of Ford, right? So from a financial standpoint, I look at that and I think this just doesn't even make any sense, right? And, and we have to kind of hone that in and, and people will also kind of compare a gov the government to a small business or a family's budget, right? And, and the government doesn't have to balance their budget. Why do I have to balance my budget or, you know, that sort of thing. But the reality is, we all have to be good financial stewards in our businesses if we want our businesses to last. What we see on the media are the aberrations, right? These are companies that have figured out how to be successful regardless um, and not take into account the profit of the company. That's not typical. That is not what we should expect in, in running a business. And your tech startups shouldn't expect that, right? Absolutely. It's, it's the scratch off lottery ticket version of building a business you yeah. know that's an anomaly yeah absolutely landon any words of wisdom from the uh nursery <laughs> yeah i just was gonna i was just kind of, my wheels were just kind of spinning as will was uh talking about spending to success so i actually uh worked uh with a a guy it was a it was a tech startup and uh we were certainly attempting to spend our way to success, uh, but it was, you know, outside money that was raised. So it, it, it seems a little bit easier when you're adopting the spend the success method when it's other people's money. But I'm, I'm curious, Will, in your experience, do you see that being the case? You know, that there people are, you know, eager and more than willing to spend other people's money, you know, maybe that they've raised or are, are you seeing them spending their own capital that they've invested? No, I think it's almost hands down. It's always when you've got someone, some venture capital funds in your company. I've, I can't think of a single instance where I've seen anyone carelessly spending their own money that they, they worked and saved for. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably 
reflective of the root cause right there, especially in the last few years when, you know, you could sneeze and it sounded like a tech idea and somebody was giving you a check to fund it. And you're like, wait, no, it was just a sneeze. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You no, know, I, I think that it's a, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of what I'm thinking of, but, you know, for venture capital firms, they should be aware of this, right? And I'm sure they are, and they know that the success rate is very, very low, but when it hits, it hits big. And so they're able to kind of weather all of the failures because of one big success, right? And it just makes me think from a financial standpoint, and I'm sure Landon feels the same way, is that if they just, if they kind of almost forced a good financial guy to be inside each of these startups, watching all that kind of stuff like a hawk, that the success rate would be higher, right? Yeah. I feel like that that would be the case. I mean, I, I'm obviously biased as a financial guy, not that I'd be the kind of guy that would go in and do something like that. But, um, you know, I just, I see it over and over and over again, how important it is to watch those finances and it could lead to greater success rates over the long run. If, if you don't have, you know, an innovator who's making the decisions and just, you know, spending other people's money willy nilly, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I've worked with quite a few startups who, you know, they just weren't even sure what the right metrics to measure were. They were they were venture capital funded and they had money and they just made up their own metrics. of like, oh, this is what success looks like, you know, versus some of the other companies I've worked with who were more mature and refined in their approach that monitored you know, how much does it cost us to acquire a customer? What's the monthly cost to maintain that customer, you know, and how profitable is, are we if we take all of our expenses across all of our customers, you know, what's the profit margin look like there, which, you know, are, are really good, strong financial metrics to determining the health of the company. But unfortunately, they're, they're rare for some, some companies. Yeah. Right. And should we let go this product line because it's not profitable and just focus here? Right. Right. There's a lot of stuff that can be done there. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with Brenda Schmidt. She's the C she was the founder of Solera. She's now the CEO of Coplex. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like they're doing some of that. She was a guest on our program maybe three or four weeks ago. And uh, you know, they're doing some of that where it's more of an incubator. Let us help you kind of get to that point and understanding that, founders have brilliant minds and come up with some great ideas, but they're not always ready to actually run that business and get it across the finish line. Right. And so Coplex is kind of filling that gap. And I'm sure there are other groups out there too, but I, I just see it so often still with venture capital funds that'll throw money at something because it seems like a great idea, but the success rate is still super, super low. And I would bet that the statistics will bear out that the, like a Coplex is going to have a higher success rate than than your typical venture capital group funding a company. Yeah, I would think they, I would expect them to have more sustained profitability, profitability versus the, the VC funds that just throw out money and hope that they throw out enough money to catch that one in a million unicorn startup. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, I would say if you're a tech entrepreneur that's listening and has an idea that you may want to lean towards more the way that a complex is set up so that you do have a greater chance at success because nobody goes in wanting to fail, right? Right. Nobody goes in thinking, well, somebody just gave me some money, so I'm going to spend it until it's gone and then I'll come up with another idea, right? I mean, I, I don't think guys are doing that. It's just they're not getting the guidance that they need to be successful. So if you truly want successful or to be successful, surround yourself with the right people from the get-go. Yeah. And I think the, a, a huge component of that, you know, is having a good board of advisors around you, you know, people who are experienced in the industry, but also people who have that, you know, that financial knowledge to, to help you understand what, what metrics you should be looking at and what success, sustained success looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And you don't have to hire somebody full time right out of the gates for that. Right. I mean, there's the fractional CFO and all that sort of stuff that's out there that, that can help with those sorts of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Some, some setup work up front and you can really refine that down to a half a dozen metrics that you report on weekly and just look at, at a glance and see what the state of everything is. Yeah. Landon, you still awake? You want to take us home? I am still awake. Very much so. 
Yeah, well, this has been this has been great, man. You've had a lot of really great suggestions and, and thoughts to share with our, our listeners and Austin and I as well. Um, one thing I, I think just in closing, uh, don't let me forget though to ask you, Will, um, how people can track you down because I, I think there will definitely be some people that want to find you. So don't let me forget about that. But um, one thing I just wanted to mention is uh, when we were communicating through email, prior to the show, you, you sent over a, a, a meme. And um, I was literally, I was laughing out loud. I thought it was uh, a great icebreaker. Uh, I love that you're kind of bringing laughter back into business. So I just wanted to ask you, is that, is that strategic, you know, to kind of build rapport and relationships or is that just kind of, just kind of who you are as a person? It's just who I am. I'm always laughing and goofing off. Uh, even, even in the midst of, you know, crisis or outages or whatever and doing disaster recovery, I'm still the guy that's over there cracking jokes while everyone else is kind of sweating things out. Yeah. Well, we, we, we certainly appreciate it here. So, Will, um, how, do our, how do our listeners, how do, how do people track you down? What's the, what's the best way to get in contact with you? You can uh, reach me via email, will at willbutton.com, or if you like Twitter, um, Twitter, I'm WF Button, and my direct messages are always open on Twitter. I guess that's better than WTF Button, right? I don't know if it really is better <laughs> or not. People might, re- might, might find you quicker. You never know. Dang, I think you're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. No, I... Yeah, no, I, I would say that there are definitely some listeners that are going to want get, uh, to get in touch with you. I appreciate the, the insight. You know, one thing that we didn't get to, which uh, I should have gotten to, is, you know, when Brenda was on, she kept throwing out all kinds of acronyms, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm not a tech guy. You know, I'm not a tech person. What are you talking about? And she kept saying MVPs, MVPs, MVPs over and over in the, in the uh, interview. And so it wasn't until I read your information that I even knew that min- that MVP stood for minimum viable products. So right, you instantly go to most valuable player. Yeah. Like, As a sports guy, that's where I go. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I think, thank you very much for the education. It's been great having you on. The conversation has been great and hopefully we stay in touch. I think the personality is great and it's obviously led you to success in your, in your career. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so much for having me on. This has been a blast. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, Will. Our pleasure. Thanks a lot, Will. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin.